Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Alright, waiting to see where De Declan's gonna sit. But uh, hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I uh, wanted to get into the scriptures and want to do a little exhortation. Are you looking? The grass is greener on the other side. I might title it a little bit shorter to fit, fit in the title, but I wanted to do this outside, brothers and sisters in Christ, but it is pouring down rain here in, in August. I was like, wow, in August here, it's pouring down rain. It's actually very cold in the house. And I'm talking with the Lord, and it's almost like I'm trying to talk myself out of it, but I'm wondering whether I should start the wood stove or not, like start burning some wood in the wood stove to get warm because it's gotten cold enough. Um, but that's the situation here. It's raining here. I wanted to do this outside. So before we get started, I want to sing a hymn, if that's okay, Brother Jesus Christ. To sing a hymn. If you know the hymn, what a day that will be. Okay? Because the whole point of this is to encourage the brethren to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And there are so many distractions as we'll go over in this world. And we need to remember eternity. Where we're going to spend eternity. Okay. So let's, I want to sing the hymn, What a Day That Will Be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shores. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, And I look upon His face, The one who saved me by His grace. When He takes me by the hand, And leads me through the promised land, What a day, glorious day, that will be. There will be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be, when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace. And He takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Brothers and sisters Christ, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's, gonna, there's coming a day where we're going we're gonna to get to go up. And I'm getting ahead of myself. And I want to exhort you guys through the scriptures. So get out your King James Bibles. I planned, I threw a lot together. And I planned to sit out there in a rocking chair on the deck and have the Bible, but go through scriptures with you. So remember, you can pause the, script, the video and turn to the scriptures on your own. Uh, because we got a lot to go through. A lot to get through. I even had it on the clipboard for being outside. But we're stuck inside with all the rain. So turn to Ephesians 6.10. I want to talk a little bit about today, what we're going through today, what we're commanded to do, how we're supposed to live today. And some of us are getting weary. Some of us are getting uh, tired. Some of us have fallen away. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood. Some brethren are getting distracted by what's going on in the world. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. The Bible talks about in 2 Thessalonians that there should be a, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that there's going to be a falling away, comma, and that man of sin be revealed. There's going to be a falling away. And when that man of sin is revealed, we go up. Okay. There's a falling away. We have to stand. Brother says Christ, sometimes brethren are getting so distracted by what's going on in the world that they forget where we're going. And I've said this before. Uh, you put on the whole, we did the whole study on the series of the armor of uh, God where it says put on Jesus Christ. But if you're putting on Jesus Christ, you're putting on that armor of light. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Are you doing this? Don't get weary in doing it. You know what's getting people to get to, to take off the armor of God? I've said this before. You get distracted by the flesh, the three enemies. The flesh, you start making provisions for the flesh to fill the lust thereof. You get into fleshliness. The world, okay, the Bible talks about covetousness and idolatry. Mm -hmm. You let Satan and his ministers start whispering in your ear. These Babel buildings have been completely infiltrated by wolves in sheep's clothing, by the enemy, these because they let everybody in. When we come together to fellowship and praise God, only saved sinners are supposed to be welcome. You go out and preach the gospel, but they start inviting Satan and his ministers in. Come on in. Next thing you know, they're they're against you. His ministers are always attacking you. I get attacked all the time, and I get weary. I get tiresome. Are you putting on the whole armor of God? The helmet for a hope of salvation. You're looking for that blessed hope at the life that you're living. The chest plate of righteousness. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is supposed to shine through you with the life that you're living. The ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. You're a living witness and you're a verbal witness. You're girding up your loins with truth. In other words, you're studying this. There's the work. You're fighting for this. There's the warfare. You, you, you have to study this. 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. You have your feet shod with the preparation of peace. If it be possible, you're supposed to be gentle unto all men. Okay, And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Be ready to give, a, give an answer of the hope that is in you, the Bible says. We're supposed to preach the gospel with peace. Right? And then you have the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and you've got the sword, which is the Word of God. It's a double-edged sword. Okay? It judges me as much as it judges anybody else. Judges my brothers and sisters in Christ. Judges the lost world. Judges false converts as false converts. We did a series on prove your own selves. Okay? And then that's not, you're not done there. We, we talked about how you're supposed to pray without ceasing. And you're always supposed to be vigilant. And that vigilant, we're gonna, I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit. That vigilance is not looking for the man of sin, that, that man of sin, the son of position, that, that antichrist that shall come. It's not Being vigilant is not looking for the mark of the beast. Being vigilant is not looking for the one world order, the one world religion, the one world economy. These are distractions from keeping you vigilant. Because you're not keeping your focus here. You're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope and living a life of Christ, no matter what the world's doing. When we look at the world and say, hey, we see some of this stuff coming in. We see technology that might be the, tech, the mark of the beast system. We see how the economy is going this direction. You know what it's supposed to do? It's supposed to make us ever more vigilant, looking for that blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope and it's supposed to motivate us, hey, we don't have much time left. We need to get this done. We need to be about our, uh, our Savior's business. I remember Jesus saying, I have to be about my Father's business. We're supposed to be about our Savior's business. Doing the work of the Lord. Living for Him every day. Okay? We fight so hard to keep that armor on, Brother Scott. I do too. We fight and we struggle. And you know what gets us? When we take, and we're, I'm getting ahead of myself, when we take our eyes off that blessed hope, when we forget that the grass is greener on the other side, and we'll get to that. Right? Turn to Galatians 6-7. Be not deceived. Galatians 
Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall, shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Here it's talking about the struggle. It's not. Some people try to say, well, this is talking about work salvation. No, it isn't. It's talking about how you get to spend that life everlasting. Rewards. Okay. Why? Because you get, verse 9 says, And let us, let us, who's the us? Save sinners. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What's that reap there? Rewards. The Bible talks about how our flesh and our spirit are contrary one to another. And we're always struggling every day, brother, says Christ. I'm struggling every day to put the flesh down. I've got to start my day with the Word of God. I've got to start my day with prayer. I listen to, to Alexander Scorby read the Old Testament every day when I'm doing work around the house, which I've been doing a lot more work indoors since it's raining, or outdoors or sitting out there on the deck. I know some of the brethren work, uh, you know, uh, a lot more than I do. And I know brethren who can sneak it in at work listening to Alexander Scorby. But we're supposed to put the flesh down. And one of the things I recommend, brother, says Christ, number one is this. This is the number, way to put, number one way to put the flesh down. The Bible says, if Thy word have I hidden my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Taking this, hiding in your heart, and living it, is what helps you the most. Second is prayer. Third, I throw the third one in there, is fasting. Brother says Christ, fasting. However you want to fast, fast. But to make sure that you're fasting every once in a while. And when you fast, you're not just fasting to fast, because the lost world does it. When you fast, you spend more time in this. When you're fasting, you spend more time in prayer. And you're putting the flesh down so that you can focus on Jesus Christ. And living for Him and pleasing Him. And putting Him first. But notice he says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Why would Paul say that? Because it's weary. The battle against the flesh is weary. Remember the three enemies. It wears you out. The battle against the, the world. And worldliness. And the world enticing you. It wears you out. The battle, like from what, mainly... You brothers says Christ that aren't in ministry like a full time. We're all in the ministry of reconciliation. But if you're not trying to stand up and do more for the Lord and more for the brethren, you might not see this as much. But those of us who are trying to serve the Lord, we get attacked a lot by the enemy, by Satan and his ministers. And we get weary. Sometimes Satan and his ministers are able to turn brethren against us that are in ministry. The world can get brethren to turn on me. Uh, I'll use me as an example, to turn on me. Uh, some people's flesh, brethren's flesh, get them to turn on one another. It's weary, fighting for the Lord every day. That's why the Bible says, um, I don't have this in my notes, but uh, I can't remember the verse. If one of you remembers the verse, please put it down in the comment section. But it talks about, he, we, we, our spirit is renewed day by day. He renews our spirit day by day. Why is it day by day? The Bible says, um, if any man come after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross daily. Why is it pick up your cross daily and follow me? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Why does it say pick up your cross daily, renew your spirit daily? Because God understands our struggles with the flesh and with the world and with the enemy. And you know how most people fail? Are you looking? The grass is greener on the other side. Getting ahead of myself again. You're forgetting something so important. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. We're supposed to remember God gives us a taste of what heaven's like and what eter what, how we're going to spend eternity, and we forget that. In 1 Peter 5.8, in 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, I'm going to stop there, but we're going to keep going there. But it says, be sober, be vigilant. I was in the military. When we were doing exercises and everything, and, 
and you're pretending to go to war, and then I've been in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, where we had it, the whole base was fenced in because on the other side of that fence there were people that hated America. And when you have to stand there in war, and I, I know other brethren who's probably been in war, actual hardcore war conditions, when you have to be truly 100% vigilant in that war, it's draining. It drains you. But it says here, whom we said steadfast, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It's draining to be sober all the time and vigilant all the time. Not sober, but the vigilant part. That's why the Bible says we're not how there's two ways we get through it, and I just said it. He renews our spirit day by day. We pray, or we start the day with the Word of God, and we stay, start the day with prayer to have our spirit renewed, and it gets us through every day. Okay. But the other reason is, is what really drains you when it comes to the lost world and warfare is fear. Fear really drains you when you're fearing the wrong thing. The Bible says we're not given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And who are we supposed to fear? God Almighty. God Almighty. Now, I'm not saying fearing God. Fearing God can drain you too if you're trying to hide sin from Him. The Bible talks about there's nothing that's hidden, that's, that's, there's nothing that's hidden that shall not be brought out in the open, that, not, that shall not be made known, I think is what the Bible says. Where God will judge the secrets of men. You can't hide from God. So there is a lost world that people start to fear God and it drains them to the point where they become broken and humble that they can repent and give their heart, give their life to Jesus Christ on the cross. But brothers and Christ, it's draining. We've got to be sober, we've got to be vigilant. We have to have our eyes open all the time. And how do we get our spirit renewed? The word of God in prayer. Coming to God. Right? Verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus, by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthen, settle you. Make you perfect? You mean we're not made perfect yet? Our soul and our spirit have been washed clean and we're connected to Jesus Christ. He's our body. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Jesus Christ, I'm trying to point up and I'm trying to hold the finger two for two. Spirit and soul, please forgive me. Spirit and soul is connected to Jesus Christ, who is our body. Who is our body? Okay. And He is perfect, yes. But we're still in this wicked body of flesh. And that's why Paul talks about the flesh warring against the Spirit. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay. And he goes on and on. Okay. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay. Verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So here we're supposed to be sober and vigilant, and when you're sober and vigilant, you know that there's afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren, and that after you have suffered a while, we go through afflictions, we go through sufferings in this world. When you stand for this book as it is, today I'm getting attacked by so many people, even ones that claim to be King James Bible believers, but they have no problem changing this book to suit their their organized religion. They have no problem changing the gospel. They have no problem changing what we call eternal security, uh, sealed into the day of redemption, knowing that you have eternal life. Uh, they have no problem messing with the blessed hope, right? the day of Christ, the day of redemption. They have no problem messing with the book when it comes to what sin is. Okay. We're having to deal with those people. And those people aren't suffering the way those of us who actually stand for this book as it is. Remember, those that are in Christ Jesus, he hath made unto us wisdom. What's wisdom? Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, see, what is it? Um, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You seek God's way. God's commands, God's words, God's way. That's the middle of wisdom. What's the end of wisdom? You hide it in your heart and you live it. You keep it. You keep God's commandments. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that keep His commandments. That's weary. It gets weary, especially when you have when the when the flesh is against you, the world's against you, 
Satan and his ministers, his servants, his children are against you. Uh, he made it uh, to us righteousness. Talking about the armor of God, putting on Jesus Christ and being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. An ambassador in a foreign land. And as time goes by, it seems, you, you, at first you seem like you're, we have like this revival and you're accepted. But after a while, they don't want you there anymore. People don't want us here. Bible-believing, God-fearing, even organized religions who have claim that they, they're claimed to be Bible believers. They claim Christianity. They claim being saints. They claim whatever the Bible says. And they steal it. They don't want us here. And it gets tiresome and it gets wearisome. How do you fall? You take your eyes off Jesus Christ. You forget what awaits us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I reckon that this suffering of this present time, remember what said that? After that ye have suffered a while, when we were in 1 Peter 5, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Here it says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. When is it going to be revealed in us? The day of Christ. The day of redemption. That blessed hope. But says Christ, I've seen so many brethren take their eyes off that blessed hope and they put it on the world. They start getting fearful. They forget to trust God. That's why we did this series of studies of trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Men are starting to go their own way. In the book of, I think it's Judges, and before the flood, they talked about how men did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't do what's right by the Lord, they did what's right in their own eyes. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The manifestation... We'll get to the next verse, get into that a little bit later. What does that mean, manifestation of the sons of God? Right now, our, uh, if you turn to 1 John 3, 1, right now we can be called the sons of God, but we haven't been manifest of the Son of God. Manifestation, we haven't physically become the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore, we can be called it. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. There is again that world. Jesus said, if they hate you, know that they hated me first. And he talks about how he has overcome the world. Salvation. How we can get saved today. How we're supposed to get saved today. Two, beloved, now are we the sons of God. So we can, we can, we can be the sons of God in title. But physically we haven't. Here it is. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Verse 19 in Romans 8, verse 19 said, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure, that hath this hope in him, the blessed hope. Turn to Titus 2.11. Turn to Titus 2.11. Brothers and Christ, we work so hard in this world, and you're supposed to. We're supposed to. I'm not kicking it. We are supposed to work hard, and it seems in these last days, you've got to work 10, 20, 30 times harder to be faithful to the Lord, to be faithful to His Word. To not give in to the flesh. To not give in to the world. I've seen great, great men of God that get spoiled by philosophy and feign deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They start getting into a battle building system where it's traditions of men, and they start steering from God's way and doing things the world's way. I've seen great men of God on uh, video platforms they get distracted by the world and worldliness, covetousness, idolatry, love of money. Respect our persons. And they start falling away. You know what, what I think what the number one thing is? is Satan gets you. Get your eyes off this. But more importantly, what the Bible says about that blessed hope. 
Satan and the world and the flesh, get your eyes off Jesus Christ and you're not looking and every man that hath this hope in him, what happened to the hope? Brethren are starting to forget. This life isn't it. We're working towards something. Remember it says that we shall reap in due season? See, let us not be wary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We're working towards something. We're living for someone, Jesus Christ, and we're working towards something, the blessed hope, and then the judgment seat of Christ. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of, of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Once again, another, another great verse that God would, wants to see all men get saved. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. It's God's grace that saves. And that gift of everlasting life, that gift is a free gift. God's grace. But people try to think that, I don't want to get into it too much, but hope. We've already done a good study on it, and I still got attacked for it anyway, where they try to say free grace and stuff like that. And it's like, it's God's grace that saves. And that grace, that gift is everlasting life, and it's a free gift. And a gift costs somebody something. It was free to me. And brother says, Christ, if you got saved, it's free to you. But it costs somebody something. It costs God, His Son on the cross. And you have to come to that cross in true biblical repentance. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And if you truly gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross and you followed those steps, after God saves you, He's going to give you a new life. You're going to be a new man or a new woman. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Anybody can get saved today. One of the things that uh, we get weary in, brothers and Christ, is we try... I've heard stories of when someone gets newly saved, they're so excited, they want to preach the gospel, and they start preaching the gospel to everybody around them. God saved me, gave me a new life, a new birth. I'm not the same man that I was. I'm not talking about me. I'm not the same man I was, if you heard my testimony. I'm nowhere the same man that I once was. God gave me a new life. And when you try to preach the gospel to everybody, you start out being excited about it. But over time, this, this world that keeps rejecting Jesus Christ starts wearing you down. They try to steal your joy and salvation. you got false comforts, easy believism, faith alone, repentless gospel. Refusing to repent and believe. They're wearing you down. This life. Your flesh is wearing you down. The world and all the false organized religions of the world is wearing you down because you're trying to preach the gospel to them. And Satan and his enemies are trying to wear you down. What keeps us going? Teaching us, it, because by the Christ, it's like, what keeps us going? Why are we still here? Some people say it was to see other people get saved. Eh, there's more to it. And they leave out the most important part. Verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You're supposed to be a living witness, not just a verbal witness. Why are we still here? We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. Living for God. Working our way to that blessed hope. Earning rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we're still here. That's why we're still here. Verse 13. Verse 12, when it said, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then there's not a period. There's a dot semicolon, so we're keeping the same thought. For the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. Well, how do we be a living witness that changed life? And it's guaranteed to those who truly get saved and born again. It's a changed life. Now, people can backpedal. People can fall away. I, we've talked about the falling away before. Where people, it just gets too hard. And you know why they fall away? They forget to look for that blessed hope. 
they take their eyes off Jesus Christ. They forget that this isn't our home. We're ambassadors in a foreign land. This isn't our home. This is, our, this is just where we dwell. But people start making this their home down here, and that things down here are more important. The, the Bible says the temporal, like the temporary, the physical, is, is more important than the eternal. What's waiting for us for all eternity. So you're being a living witness with the life that you live, and you're a verbal witness. Verse 13, what is that? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to look for that blessed hope. It's just not something we say. It's just not something sitting outside, looking up and going, okay, I'm going to sit here all day doing nothing for the Lord. I'm not going to listen to the Word of God. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to go hang out, hand out gospel tracts when I'm in town. I'm, just, I'm doing nothing for the Lord. I'm sitting here and I'm looking up, and I, therefore I'm looking for the Lord. I'm starting to get back into old sins that I gave up for the Lord I'm starting to try, I'm trying to resurrect the old man. Paul warns us about not resurrecting the old man. That's not looking. If you're truly looking for that blessed hope, the life that you live will show it. And there's brethren that have turned their back on looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. They're not looking for Jesus to call them home every day. And it shows by the life they're living. They're not living a life of Christ anymore. They're living a, car, a, a, a fleshly life. They're getting distracted by things down here, and things down here are more important than things up there. This is not no, number one in their life anymore. Some just use this to make money. Battle building systems, some of the men here on YouTube, they use it to make money. But it's not number one. It's not, it's not, it doesn't come first in their life. Verse 14, And the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us, from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We're going to be serving God for all eternity. You can have brethren that fall away, that fall down, or are not that excited about serving God today, but when he redeems us, those who are truly saved and born again, and we go up, we're going to be zealous of good works. You're supposed to be zealous of good works today. It's supposed to start at salvation. And I believe anyone who's truly got saved and born again, they were zealous for good works at salvation when God saved you. But over time, the flesh got in the way. The world got in the way. The enemy got in the way. It's not too late to repent and get your heart right with the Lord and get back to a standing position, putting on the whole armor of God and living for Him, being a living witness and a verbal witness, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. It's never too late. Verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise you. These things speak. How often do you hear about, hey, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. How are you living, brother and sister Christ? How is your walk with the Lord going? Are you confessing your faults one to another to get prayer and be held accountable to your faults? I've already mentioned my faults. My biggest faults is Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, cartoons. Anime, I had a lot of anime. Right. I have my struggles with the flesh, and I always confess my faults. God's got my life cleaned out, but we're, people think that if you're not physically doing it, then you're innocent. The Bible says if you took pleasure in them that do them, you're just as guilty. Up here, if you're thinking about it, and I can, I can go through, I used to have over 300 movies. I could sit on the deck, I could be talking with the Lord, and I could have said something that reminded me of a movie, and for the next five minutes, I start thinking of that movie, and I'm running that movie in my head for the next five minutes. Now it's usually just uh, you know, 15, 20 seconds. God's got it down to where I can. He's blessed me with the strength, it's His strength, not mine, to get it out. Get it out quick. But I'm still guilty, and I have to say, Lord, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you confessing your faults one to another? These things speak the changed life. Preaching against sin and wickedness. Preaching that you're supposed to be a living witness for Jesus Christ. Encouraging you, brother, says Christ, to start your day with the Word of God and end your day with the Word of God. Pray without ceasing. These things speak and exhort. This whole thing is supposed to be about exhortation. And rebuke with all authority when you have men that turn their back. 
on looking present tense for that blessed hope where they stop putting this first and the world comes first. We rebuke them. I always rebuke them through Bible teachings. Proving them wrong that, hey, they, they've lost their way. Here's what the Bible says. They're starting to turn their back on a proper teaching. Here's what the Bible says. That's how you, you rebuke them. You also do it to their face. Whole other discussion. But some brethren think rebuke them to a camera it counts. It doesn't. If, if them that sin rebuke before all, you, you do it before their face. If a man's a heretic after the first and second admonition, that's to them, them to their face, not to a camera. Whole other discussion, though. But let no man despise thee. Brothers and Christ, we're working hardcore to live a life of Christ. And we're going through a lot of uh, struggles, sufferings. And we're getting tired. But like I said, God will renew our spirit every day. What keeps us going? This is number one. But number one, the precious promise, the number one thing is through the Word of God, that blessed hope. That's what keeps me going every day. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. There's times I sit out there and talk with the Lord and say, Lord, I know and... How do I say this? I say, I'm nothing. You're everything. And I know to the Lord, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but I keep telling myself I'm nothing to remind myself when it comes to the Lord, He has to be everything. The moment you start thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think, I've seen great men fall. When they start thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think, when they start thinking they're something compared to God, they're nothing compared to God. I'm nothing. I, and I remember uh, John the Baptist, he said, I must become less so that he can become more. Now I took that and I was like, well, in my life as a Christian, my flesh needs to become less, the world needs to become less, and Satan and his, and his children need to become less, the three enemies, so that God can become more in my life. you got to get those three things under control. you got to war against them. Get the enemy and, the, and his children out. The world, you keep the world at bay, and you put the flesh down. So Jesus and his perfect written word is everything to you. 1 Corinthians 15.50 1 Corinthians 15.50 Sometimes we forget, brothers and Christ, that catching away when it happens. I believe it's going to be a huge event. The whole world's going to see it. And it's not something that's open over just like that. Brethren don't know how to read the Bible sometimes. And I don't think it has to do with not being able to read the Bible sometimes. I think what it really has to do with is traditions of men. Someone before said it's all going to happen like that. So then i got to teach it all happens like this. And the next person has to... Why don't you actually read the Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, 50. What happens in a moment in a twinkling of an eye? Not us going up. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now I disagree with some of the brethren. I think some of them are just desperate for new teachings. And they'll come out and say, the blood gets left behind. It says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They never say the flesh gets left behind, just the blood, just the blood. No, if that was true, both the blood and the flesh would get left behind. But what happens? Let's keep reading. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That blood is changed. That flesh is changed. Nothing gets left behind. Verse 52, in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. What's in the moment in the twinkling of an eye? But we shall all be changed. At the last trump, for, the, for this, for the corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So then this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. That's the moment in the twinkling of an eye. I can't say it enough. It's just when we get our new bodies. When we now become the sons of God fully and completely. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Are you looking forward to that, brothers and Christ? Remember I said we have to keep putting the flesh down? What happens when we no longer have to put the flesh down? The flesh isn't against us. It's not warring against the spirit. It's not warring against our soul. It's in perfect 
harmony with our soul. It's in perfect submission to the soul. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Brother, this is Christ today, in uh, 1 John, I think it is, it talks about if we, if we confess our sins, it's time to save sinners. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to cleanse us from our sins, or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? I like to say the verse is right, but sometimes... If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? And I always say, get, get, your, get, get it confessed, get it forsaken now. If you're not doing something God's way, get it confessed, get it forsaken, and get back to doing things God's way. If it's sin, get it out of your life. When we were talking about being in Christ Jesus, we talked about wisdom and righteousness. We let, the next part was sanctification. We're spending our whole life sanctifying ourselves. We get sent out. Then it tries to creep back in, and we have to get it back out again. It's a constant struggle. And the last part of being in Christ Jesus is made unto us redemption. Four parts to prove that you're in Christ Jesus. Redemption. Are you looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living? But the sting of death is sin. Right? Um, there's, uh, there's none... Righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that understand it. I'm getting this little mixed up a little bit. But I always say, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. The sting of death is sin. What's this victory? God gave us victory over the law of sin and death. And that victory happens at that blessed hope. He's, 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 he's redeemed our soul and our spirit, but we're still in this wicked body of flesh. We don't have the victory over sin yet. He, he, he freed us from the law of sin and death, but death gets dropped. Now we're still under the law of sin. The sting of death is sin. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's for both saved and lost. But there's coming a day where we don't have to deal with it anymore. We don't have to deal with a, a, a sinful, sinful body, wicked flesh. We get a new body. And it says, And the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. Wait, wait. You're saying, looking for that blessed hope in this situation, he's talking more about the new, when we get the new birth, the, become the sons of God. We get new bodies. We're supposed to be looking for that. And what's the point of looking for that? What's the, I'm not the point, but the evidence that we're looking for it? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding at the, in the work of the Lord, for as much, much as you know that your labor is not in vain. That's supposed to be a motivator to keep us going. Looking for that blessed hope. We're going to get new bodies. Then we're going to get caught up. First, Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I believe a cloud's going to form under our feet, and we're all going to go up, and that's going to take time. Like I said, it's an event that the whole world's going to see. How do I know it's an event the whole world's going to see? I know some brethren have said it, people might not even notice it because they forget about a key part here we're going to read. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, why is it going to be a huge event? I, I agree, I don't believe there's many Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women left. People that are truly saved today is such a small percentage. Remember, there's over 7 billion people in the world today. I would be shocked if a million of them are really saved and born again. Organized religion, false religion, Satan's religion, all her daughters, Mystery Babylon and all her daughters are taking over the world. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. It says here, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. They forget that part. Some of the brethren that teach that it, it's gonna, people will hardly even notice. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Others that have no hope, they don't have that blessed hope. Remember what it said before I, before we got saved, brother says Christ, we were without God and without hope in the world. That blessed hope, we had nothing to live for, nothing to look forward to. When you don't have Jesus Christ. When you refuse to repent and believe, you don't have that blessed hope. 
Verse 14. Repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, He gives you the new life, the new creature in Christ Jesus. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. That's why it's going to be a big event. For this we say unto you by the word of our Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You mean 2,000 years worth of truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian men, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, in Christ Jesus, Christ in, in Christ, they... You'll see all these people appear all around in the world. All these people are just going to appear. They're the dead in Christ that rise first. You think that's not going to? Uh, it's not going to be noticed. We always talk about all the babies that are innocent that they they disappear. No, no, they don't. First, the dead in Christ shall rise. All these bodies with white robes, perfect bodies, are going to appear everywhere. That's instant. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they get their new bodies. Then we which are alive, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we get our new bodies. As they're going up, we get our new bodies, those of us that are alive. And they're going up already. Cloud under their feet, because that's how Jesus went up. That's how I believe we're going to go up, because it likens it to how Jesus was, was raised from the dead. So we're going to be raised as Jesus was raised. He got a new glorified body. We're going to get a new glorified body. Jesus was caught up. We're going to get caught up. How was Jesus caught up? A cloud formed under his feet and caught him up into the air. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's why there's going to be clouds everywhere. There might be clear skies when this event starts, the blessed hope. But when that dead in Christ... 2,000 years worth of Christians appear. There's Peter Ruckman. You probably won't recognize him, but there's Peter Ruckman. There's this guy. There's that guy. All these uh, uh, great men of God, of uh, great men of the faith, going all the way back to Paul. There's Paul. There's John. You probably won't recognize him, but there they are. That cloud forms under their feet, they start going up. So then when we look up, what do we see in the sky? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. There's going to be clouds in the sky. You can't beat the book. If you actually have the Holy Spirit and you believe in this book, and you pray over this book, God will give you the answer. I had someone tell me, how is clouds going to be all over the world at the same time? That's how. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Have you forgotten that? Getting back to this study, the grass is greener on the other side. Have you forgotten what we're supposed to be looking forward to that motivates us to stay faithful to this book, that stays faithful to the Lord, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, and to show true love for the lost world, which is preaching the gospel to them, to be a living witness and a verbal witness? In verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I can't say it enough. We're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not a comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another. We're looking for Jesus Christ to call us home, that blessed hope. What do you need to get done for the Lord? I've said this time and time again. If Jesus came back tomorrow, what do you need to get done for him today? If Jesus came back, to, if, if, if Jesus came back today, are you ready? Can you be like Paul who said, I fought the good fight, I finished my course. Now Paul knew he was going to die the next day, but all through the Pauline epistles, he's pushing, we're looking for that blessed hope. We're looking for Jesus Christ with the life that we're living. And you've got men who've turned their back on it. Have they gotten you, brother, sister Christ, to turn your back on it? You're not looking for that blessed hope. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. It helps us. When we're weary, when we fall down, it helps us get back up. Brothers and Christ, if you've fallen down, you can get back up. Keep looking for that blessed hope. It's a motivator to get your butt back up. To get back in a standing position for the Lord. 
having done all to stand. Right? We're looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living, brother, says Christ. And we get weary in well-doing because we forget that this world isn't it. We're going home someday. And when we do get caught up, at first it's going to, I believe at first it's going to be a joyous thing. Victory! Victory! Remember who has given us the victory? Over the sting of death? The law of sin and death? Who's given us the victory over the law of sin and death? Who's given us victory over this wicked body of flesh? Who's given us victory over this wicked world we don't have to put up with anymore? Who's given us victory over the enemy and his ministers and his children that we don't have to put up with anymore? We're going home to our real home. Who's given us, that's when we get to see victory, victory, victory. But I believe that that joy of victory, it's... It's, it's going to last forever, but it's going to die down a little bit. Why? Because what comes after the catching away of the body of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's why looking for that blessed hope, Brother Jesus Christ, is such a motivator for those of us who believe in this book. For those who are truly saved and born again, we realize, okay, now I'm looking for that blessed hope. I didn't realize it as much when you first got saved, but God really taught me, after, after I got saved the right way, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. When I got saved the right way, God started telling me, I, I said this before, Lord, if all I get to do is wash the feet of the saints. When I got, first got saved, I was just so grateful that God would save a wretched man like me. False convert most of my life. Part of easy believism. The faith alone crowd. So fleshly, so worldly. I didn't have Jesus Christ. I didn't actually have His words. But... You know, some of them who, who profess to have his words, like the King James Bible, they claim to be King James Bible believers, still reject the true plan of salvation. But when God actually saved me, I was just so excited about being saved. I said, Lord, if all I get to do is wash the feet of the saints for all eternity, because I was thinking, you know, newly saved, that, you know, I'd have to be at the front gate of heaven and I'd wash the feet of the saints for all eternity, you know. I'm just so grateful that you would save a wretch like me. I don't deserve it, Lord. But after a while, God started teaching me that you need to be aspiring to more than that when it comes to eternity. How you're going to spend eternity is determined by how you live for Jesus Christ today. I believe that. I believe it. God's like, hey, look at these uh, uh, crown rewards. Hey, let me tell you a little bit about the Judgment seat of Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.1. Let me tell you a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ. You're supposed to be aspiring for a little bit more. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. You know when Jesus says, I, I, in my Father's house there are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Sometimes I believe that place that he's preparing isn't like a place in heaven. It's our new bodies where we're going to be so we can go to heaven and spend eternity with the Lord. Notice how it likens it. For this house of this tabernacle were dissolved, I believe it's talking about the body. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's what Jesus is preparing for us, I believe. You can try to correct me, but that's what I believe the more I read the Word of God. For this, I see, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. That blessed hope. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in his, this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. This mortal must put on immortality. This corruption must put on incorruption. Why? So we can go to heaven. 
And what's the first thing that happens in heaven? Verse 5. Now he that has wrought us from the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnestness of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. But how can we do that? We have to have new bodies. This wicked body of flesh can't go to heaven. We need new bodies, and that's what he's talking about here. Verse 19, we want that blessed hope. We're looking for it with the life that we're living. You have so many people sitting around, I believe false converts, are like, oh, I want that blessed hope. But their life says, I don't want it. Their life says, I hate it, because they're not looking for that blessed hope with the life that they're living. They're not giving Jesus Christ their all every day. Verse 9, wherefore we labor that we labor. Why? Why are we laboring? Why are we still here? I've said it before. That blessed hope. The judgment seat of Christ. How we get to spend eternity. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing that is done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're working hard, brothers and Christ. We're going through suffering. After that you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we reap if we shall reap if we faint not, having done withstanding the evil day, and having done all to stand. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For we must all prepare the uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body, according to he hath done. This body right here, the wicked body of flesh. What have you done for the Lord? How did you live your life? Were you a living witness, a verbal witness? And if you were, it's hard. It's a hard life. It's a tiring life. But God will give you, this is a whole other study sometime maybe, but God will give you joy and peace and happiness from time to time. But times you're going to have sorrow. There's times where you're going to be, so, uh, you're going to be tired. Sometimes you're going to get frustrated. Sometimes you're going to fail. This is what this is talking about. Our whole life and our walk with the Lord is what's going to get judged up there. Whether it be good or bad. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3.9. 1 Corinthians 3.9. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 3.9. For ye are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandmen, ye are God's building. There it is again. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. What does he mean by he laid the foundation? There's no foundation that can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's talking about salvation. He said, okay, you're saved now. Here's the word of God. This is what I do to people that you lead to Christ. Get a King James Bible and now start learning what pleases God and how to live a life of Christ. How do you build upon? The foundation is salvation, Jesus Christ. You got saved, born again. Now you're starting to build. What? You're starting to earn rewards in heaven. But let every man take heed how, heed how to, he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Jesus Christ, salvation, you get saved. Now there's a changed life, it's guaranteed. Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, the life you're living until you get caught up in life or in death. But remember, the dead in Christ rise first. We're all going to be part of that blessed hope, that event. That I believe the world's going to see. We all have to stand there and answer to Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Now, what we set up here? For he must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone that may receive the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, they, they, they hate these easy believisms. They mess up Ephesians 2, uh, 8, and 9. It starts out with, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And they switch it around and say, no, it's by your faith that you're saved through grace. No, by saying faith alone. It's what they did that saved them. No, the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Faith alone. You just made faith of yourselves. It's no longer God's grace that saves. It's your faith that saved you. And we're fighting these people. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in repentance. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Faith in confessing both to prayer to a God you've never seen or ever believed in before. And faith that when you ask God to save you, He can save you. He can do what he said he can do. Faith that God's going to give you a new life. That's what, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The works there, you, you can't get it by going through the law of sin and death. You can't do it by going through the Old Testament Levitical laws and keeping the Ten Commandments. That's the works part. But it's also not of yourselves, and they've turned faith into of themselves. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's verse 10 that they like to kick out. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. Why? And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You're going to have to answer to God someday. Good works follow true conversion. You want to please God. You want to do things God's way. You want to take God's word and hide in your heart and live it. You want to put the flesh down. You want to fight off the world. You want to fight off the enemy. That being said, it's tiresome. It's not always easy. There's times I failed in the flesh. There's times I failed when it came to the world. The world got the better of me. The flesh got the better of me. Enemies got the better of me. If any man come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and get back to following Jesus. I've had to repent, forsake where, where the world, uh, the flesh got the better of me, forsake where the world got the better of me, forsake when the enemy gets the better of me, and I get back to doing things God's way and get back to following Jesus. Why? Because my works are going to be judged someday. How I live my life now that I'm saved and born again is going to be judged someday. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, works that line up with the Bible, good works, God's way, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, works that are based off the flesh, works that's based off the world's way, these Babel buildings, are, they predominantly go off traditions of men, rudiments of the world, the world's way, works that are based off Satan and his way. If you're truly saved and you get deceived by these three, and I have sometimes, that work's going to be burned up. It shall suffer lo he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall not, he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You don't lose salvation. You've got that eternal, uh, we call it eternal security, but you're sealed into the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We have that crown of life, and we're not going to lose that crown of life. But how do you get to spend eternity? The reward's there. It's based off of that first part we talked about, living a life of Christ. Now there's so much more we could get, but this is what God put on my heart before we start talking about the catching up. And now we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Why is it so important, brothers and sisters, Christ? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.11. Why is it so important? Because how you spend eternity is important. One of the rewards is if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. Wouldn't you like to come back when Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble to go into the day of the Lord? Wouldn't you like to be able to come back and serve God and be where Jesus is serving him down here? Or do you, are you going to be one of those people that get stuck in heaven? Because you didn't suffer for him. 
You got excited. I told you there's some people I believe they get saved. There's the changed life. They start throwing everything out and they get excited. They start running 100 miles an hour. And when they trip over that first rock or they run into that first wall and fall down, they don't ever get back up. They don't amount to much anything as a Christian. They give up pretty quick. They give in too easily. And they get up there. They don't get to come down and rule and reign with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that going to be you? Or are you actually going to suffer for Jesus Christ? What the Bible says is suffering for Him. Not what the world says. it, Because you've got a lot of people that have that persecution complex. Oh, I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. When they're doing nothing of the sentence. They're not doing it. They're suffering for the flesh. They're suffering for the world. They're suffering for, the, for Satan and, and, his, and his children, the three enemies. But they're not suffering for Jesus Christ His way. I mean... But there are rewards that have to do with how we get to do things in the future. After we get our new bodies and go up and go through the judgment seat of Christ. So what do we do? 2 Corinthians 5.11 I'm exhorting you and I'm trying to encourage you, brothers says Christ, to stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. Make sure that you're going through your life every day to a week, every week. At least once a week and going through your life saying, Lord, is there something I need to get out of my life? Is, am I doing something wrong? Am I treating my brothers and sisters in Christ wrong? Am I handling your word of God wrong? Am I treating the lost world the wrong way? Why? 2 Corinthians 5.11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be a terror. It's going to be, it's going to be fearful. I'm going to have to stand up there before Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I, I believe I'm going to fall flat on my face. I don't know. But I'm going to have to stand there, and I'm going to have to owe up to my life as a Christian. And I'm telling you right now, I've made a lot of mistakes as a Christian, especially early on in my walk. As a babe in Christ, as a novice, early on in my walk, I made a lot of mistakes. Now, if we confess our sins, like in 1 John, if we confess our sins... He is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we get it repented and fixed now, part of me believes we won't have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. But we get up there, I, I could think I got it all done and everything, everything's good. We get caught up, I go to stand up there and God points out this and I'm like, oh, he's right. And he points out this wood, hay, stubble. That's why we're supposed to keep judging ourselves all the time. I find stuff every once in a while. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was there. I'm sorry, Lord, I wasn't doing this right. I let that back in, Lord, get it back out. It's a constant struggle. By the therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we were made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. We commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them with glory in appearance and not in heart. God looks at the heart. By the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Remember, God talks about certain people that on the outside they look like wide sepulchers, but inwardly they're full of dead man's bones. You can have brethren that are, you know, born again. They've got that crown of, of life. But they start falling into the trap of glorying in appearance. You know, like those Sunday Christians? The Wednesday evenings and Sunday morning Christians where they just glory in appearance for so many hours and then they get to go back to, to acting like the world, looking like the world, talking like the world. I believe those are mostly false converts. But on here, same thing. I call them online Christians. People come on and try to act like Christians while they're online, but what is their heart? God looks at the heart. They try to put on a show and talking... And they try to put on the show in appearance at these battle buildings. But God looks at the heart. By the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Why? Because you're going to have to answer for your life as a Christian. And you can try to put on a show. But it's not going to work with God. When you stand before God, there is no hiding anything. Philippians 2.9, if you turn to Philippians 2.9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, 
I have to say that like that, brothers of Christ, because today they're trying to do everything they can to get rid of the word, the name Jesus. Um, gosh, I can't even think. Ye Yahshua, Yahshua, Yeshua, and stuff like that. They're doing everything they can to get rid of the name Jesus. The Lord, you know, Christ is King. What about Jesus Christ is King of the Jews? No, no, it's just Christ is King. They do everything they can to get rid of the name Jesus. That the name Jesus, every knee should bow. The judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Of things in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ, or I'm sorry, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Okay. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved... The Bible talks about how God the Father has passed all judgment to the Son. Jesus is going to be judging us at the judgment seat of Christ, which is what we're talking about here. And He's going to be judging the lost, the rest of the world. He's going, to, he's going to be judging the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ. At the great white throne judgment, He's going to be judging the rest of the world. Everyone has to go through it. One of the biggest lies today with the easy believism and the faith alone, they act like I'm past judgment, I can do whatever I want, I can live however I want, and then Paul gets on to him and he warns us about the judgment seat of Christ. By the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have also obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The salvation of this life when it comes to how you have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how are we their dead as sin live any longer therein? Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Such were some of you. And he goes through all these sins and says, Such were some of you. He keeps pushing it. Why? Because we're going to have to answer for it someday. And he's easy to believe. It. They don't think, well, there's no more judgment. I, I've escaped judgment. No, you escaped the, the judgment when it comes to the law of sin and death through that gift that God has and through God's that sac the cost of that gift His sacrifice of His Son on the cross so we can have that gift of everlasting life but there's still judgment and that judgment it determines how you get to live for all eternity if you're truly saved and born again but they don't like judgment you ever notice that brothers of Christ all these e organized religions they either use judgment to, as a fear tactic, tactic to control people. May, when it comes to doubting your salvation, you have to earn it. You, you don't have it. You've got to merit salvation. You've got to be worthy of salvation and everything. No, we don't do good works to be worthy of salvation. That was a gift. That's something I could never ha earn. That's something I can never, ever be worthy of. This is talking about rewards at the judgment seat of Christ and being judged as the life of a Christian. Not for eternal salvation, salvation in this life. How we lived our life for a Christian. And they don't like that judgment. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, brothers of Christ, you said, well, the name of this title was Looking. Are you looking? Yes, are you looking with the life you're living? We, what's the motivator? We're not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't get distracted by that garbage. We can see a lot of things leading up to the time of Jacob's trouble, but that's supposed to motivate us to be living for the Lord even more. Get your life sanctified. Make sure that righteousness that God's imputed to you, that you're putting on that armor of light, that you're putting on Jesus Christ, you're living for Him, you're doing things His way. You're being a living witness and a verbal witness. You're loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're exhorting them through the Scriptures, encouraging them to stand for this book, to keep living right, keep doing right. But the time of Jacob's trouble is not supposed to be a distraction where we start preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble, and I see it. These so, they used to be great men of God, but now it's kind of hard to tell that they're a man of God because they've strayed so much from this because they're getting distracted by this. The world. The time of Jacob's trouble. I don't have to prepare for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for that blessed hope. And as I'm looking for that blessed hope, I'm doing my best to live for Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will take care of us. We still have to work. If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. There's nothing wrong with storing up a little bit of food every year. I do. 
but I'm not acting like I'm going to be going through seven years of hard times before I get caught up and then claim I'm, I'm not post-trib, I'm not post-trib. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. In your actions, and your deeds. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope because right after that blessed hope is the judgment seat of Christ. In the time of Jacob's trouble, which everyone's getting worried about everything that's going on in the world, the wars and rumors of wars, the riots, and you know how the governments are rising and falling, that's been happening for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years. We need to continue living for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Brothers, this is Christ. I wanted to go through all that to encourage you that I understand what you're going through, and I want you to understand that I'm going through it. All the brethren are going through it. Remember what the Bible said. Uh, what it talks about how the, the suffering that's, uh, that's, it, that's in your brethren. Let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we should reap if we faint not. But there was a verse in there that talked about how, uh, don't worry because you're not the only one. The person, it's, it's in the brethren too. All the hardship that you're going through, your brothers and sisters in Christ are going through. You're not the only one. What motivates us to live for Jesus Christ every day? Looking for that blessed hope and understanding that after that blessed hope, when we get our new bodies and we get to get caught up, it's glorious victory. God has given us full victory, not two-thirds victory, the, the soul and the flesh being, I mean, the soul and the spirit being redeemed, but he's given us full victory. Our body gets redeemed now, too, and we're completely redeemed. And we have full victory over the law of sin and death, the law of sin, this wicked body of flesh, the world, Satan, and we go home to be with our Lord, but we have to go through that judgment seat of Christ. What happens after the judgment seat of Christ? We get to go to heaven. The grass is greener on the other side? Yes, brother, says Christ. The grass is greener on this side. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12.1. Have you forgotten what, heaven's, what the Bible says heaven looks like? Have you forgotten? Where we get to spend eternity? And if you keep remembering what, how we get to spend eternity, uh, the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. It gives us strength to keep going down here when you remember where we're going to someday. 2 Corinthians 12.1 It is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Why does it say third heaven? Because you've got the sky, which we can see up to the clouds. And then from the clouds to the stars is the th second heaven. And then past the stars is where heaven is. The third heaven. I mean, heaven where God's throne is. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. We're going to be caught up someday. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise. You remember when Jesus looked to the uh, thief on the cross and said, this day ye shall be with me in paradise? He wasn't talking about Abraham's bosom. That's a fall. I believe that's wrong. I believe that's wrong. We did a study on this. Paradise is a reference to heaven, not Abraham's bosom, not hell, because that's where Abraham's bosom is. It's in hell. You have Abraham's bosom up here, and then you have the lower parts of hell, the fiery side of hell. Okay. That, that, that thief... He said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Well, Jesus, his body, was put into the grave for three days. Who's the soul of Jesus Christ? God the Father. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. That thief got to go to heaven and be with God the Father. He was caught up into paradise. This day you shall be with me in paradise. I'm looking forward to that. And heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for man to utter. Paradise. We're going to get a little bit of detail of that word paradise. Of such a one will I glory. When we see a brother or sister in Christ pass away, we glory in it. They're now in heaven. They're now where we want to be. Remember we read about that? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's all our heartfelt desires. Another reason why we're still here is not just for that blessed hope and the judgment seat of Christ to earn rewards 
and to see, see people get saved, which is part of those rewards, but also to encourage one another, because Paul says, but to be here for you is more need for, for me to be here is more needful for you. To be here for one another, to encourage one another, to help one another when you see a brother or sister in Christ fall, and stumble and fall, you help them back up. That's why it says in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Our heartfelt desire is to see brethren exhort them and correct them to get them back on their feet. Online, it's just this big battle of just correcting people and fighting each other and attacking each other and everything with the heartfelt desire to see them get destroyed. That's the wrong way. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Remember what he says? The sufferings of this, present, uh, of this present world is not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. Why is he glorying in his infirmities? Because if you're living for this book and doing things God's way, you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you're a living witness and a verbal witness, you're going to have infirmities. But God sees it. And at the judgment seat of Christ, if let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. I will glory in mine infirmities. Turn to John 14, 1. This is it again. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I believe that house, that mansion he's talking about, is our, we get a new body. But we get to go be with the Lord, and we get to go up to paradise. Have you forgotten that, brother says Christ? When you're looking at how hard it is living for the Lord and standing for the Lord and doing what's right and how you get weary of putting down the flesh every day because you have to, you're getting weary of having to pick up that cross every day because it says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself daily, or no, deny himself and take up his cross daily. You're getting tired of failing the Lord sometimes. You get tired of dropping that cross. You get tired of fighting the lost world. It'd just be easier, and then you remember the Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove that living witness. Prove that verse that says that the grace of God that hath appeared to all men. Here it is. Titus 2, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You're like, but, but Lord, I had, uh, was it, um, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yeah, you're right, Lord, you're right, Lord. I want, I want your love to shine through me. I want Jesus Christ to shine through me. But Lord, it, it, it would be easier if, if I could be a little bit friendly to the world. The adulteresses and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity against God. Whosoever there shall for shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Still goes back to compromising. No, nope, no, nope, not going to do it. It's hard. It's hard. But remember, it's all worth it in the end. Don't you remember New Jerusalem? It's in heaven. When we go up there to be judged at the sea, there's New Jerusalem is in heaven. And it comes down after the heaven, uh, after the, this is the time of the Gentiles. We leave, we go up, we get caught up, we get our new bodies, we get our white robes, new bodies, we go up, we get judged at the judgment seat of Christ. We have the time of Jacob's trouble that happens. Jesus comes down and if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Some of us will get to come back down with him. And he starts the day of the Lord. You go through the whole day of the Lord, then, God, then Satan's let loose for a season. Because remember, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the man of sin and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, and Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit. And after the thousand years, Satan's let loose for a season. Then God rains down fire and wipes the old heaven, the old earth, Talking about the heaven, I believe it's talking about the lower heavens, you know, but that's a whole other discussion. Those are wiped out. Then there's the great white throne judgment, 
great, he, where there's the same great white throne that we got judged at when it was the judgment seat of Christ, but now this is the great white throne where the world is getting judged at that point. Anyone else who hasn't been judged yet, that's where they're going to get judged. Then God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and you see New Jerusalem coming down. That's where we're going to be. I believe New Jerusalem's in heaven. That's where we're going to be waiting for it to come down. In Revelation 21.9, turn to Revelation 21.9. Remember what it said in paradise? Caught up into paradise? Revelation 21.9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. We're the bride of Christ. But what does he show them? He's not showing them people. He's showing a city. Could it be that's where we live? That city was created for us? Verse 10. And he carried me away into the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Remember, we get grafted in. You say, what does this have to do with the, the bride of Christ? We get grafted in. Verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, on the wall of the city had twelve fountains, and in them names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And I believe they all had to, uh, the twelve apostles there, they had to die a, a martyr's death. Except maybe John. He's the only exception. Whole nother study. Because I remember, if you remember at the end of, um, maybe it was John itself. At the very end of John, the last chapter, it talks about, the last two chapters, it talks about how Peter looks at him and says, What would you have to do with this man? And he's talking about John, and he's like, If he should tarry, should I come? Shall I come till I come? What is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, don't worry about what God has for other people. Worry about what God has for you. Make sure you're living right first and foremost before you try to help another person live right. And make sure you st stick with you first. But the second part you get from that is John, if he should tarry, shall I come? And John did tarry. That's where we're getting revelation from to begin with. He got to see Jesus come back. He got to see the future. Prophecy. Verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden knee reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth foursquare, and the length of it is large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand forelongs. The length and the breadth that height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of the man, that is, of the angel, of the angel, <laughs> man, angel, angels look like men, and are referred to as men a lot. 18. And the building of the wall of it was a, of jasper. Here we get into more law, visual. The building of the wall is like jasper. Look up some of these stones sometimes, and look at how they look when they're done, where they look their best. Look at these stones at their best. Well, it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the fountains of the wall of the city were garnished with all manners of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, second found, uh, the second sapphire, the third chal chaldini, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophilus, the eleventh a jaseth, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. It's all about it's just paradise coming down. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as if it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun. The city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God 
did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the king of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The kings of the earth. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there. We don't have to sleep anymore. We don't have to eat. You can't eat, but you don't have to eat. You don't, you don't get tired. You don't sleep. You don't feel pain. For there shall be no light, night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abominations, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Brothers and sisters Christ, I know this has been a little bit of a long exhortation, but brothers and Christ, do not be weary in well-doing. Do not be weary in well-doing. Don't forget where we're going. Don't forget that blessed hope. That's what we're looking for. Don't forget the judgment seat of Christ in your life that you're living down here. And don't forget what it's going to be like when we get to go to heaven. We don't know exactly 100%, but we, we know we're going to get perfect bodies. And we can daydream where I never get tired. Right now I'm getting old, brothers of Christ. I know I'm not super old yet, but I'm starting to feel it. My knees, my back... Um, I'm starting to feel tired from time to time, where I have to lay down for 10 minutes and close my eyes. Uh, I've got glasses, so my eyes are going. The deterioration of just getting old starts getting to you. And the thought of, Lord, what if I could be that when I was in my best condition of my life, was like anywhere you know, between 28 and 35, and it's like, what if I was like that for all eternity? Well, someday you will be. Someday you will be, Philip. And brothers says Christ, someday you will be. And we remember, this world isn't it. If you get distracted by the flesh, and you get knocked down, and a brother corrects you, take the correction, put the flesh back down, and get back to a standing position for the Lord. If you get distracted by the world and get knocked down, and a brother comes to you, or the Lord comes to you in your daily reading, and corrects you, put, the world, put it out, and get back to a standing position with the Lord. If you've wronged a brother and sister in Christ, get it right. If you're sinning, get that sin out and get your heart right with the Lord. If you've wronged a brother and sister in Christ, get your heart right with the Lord. If you're falling into the world, covetousness, love of money, uh, idolatry, where things down here are more important than the Lord, you turn them into lowercase g gods, kick those lowercase g gods out and get back to serving the Lord. I can't stress it enough, brother says Christ, get your heart right with God now. If Jesus was to come back tomorrow in the clouds to call us home, what do you need to get done for him today? What if he came back today? Are you ready? When I first got saved, that was the biggest thing and the, the, you know, the biggest motivation to get Bible studies done, to get them out for men in ministry, for brothers and sisters in Christ to live the life of Christ, to stay with sisters in Christ, to stay in the boundaries that God set for you. Brothers, to stay in the boundaries God set for you. And as a, when it comes spiritual, as a safe sinner, to stay in the boundaries that God set for us. And to live for Jesus Christ with all our heart was a big motivator because we're looking for that blessed hope. It could happen any day now. But over time, brethren have stopped looking. They forget about the judgment seat of Christ. Some have forgotten about getting a new body and what's it going to be like. They've forgotten what heaven looks like. What it's going to be like in heaven. That Paul's like, I glory over someone who's in heaven versus someone down here. Down here I glory in my infirmities that I'm suffering for Jesus Christ because the suffering of this present time is not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. And some of them get to go see that glory. There's brethren that got to go see it before us, brother says Christ. They really did. One last hymn, and then I'm going to wrap this up and call it a day, brothers and Christ. One last hymn. If you know, you can look up when we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. Have you forgotten that that's where we're heading and we're working our way to heaven? Not to earn heaven, but we're working our way towards it. There's that old song, uh, Climbing High Mountains, Trying to Make My Way Home. Carrying Hard Burdens, Trying to Make My Way Home. Why? Because this isn't our home. That's our home. When we all get to, to heaven, 
Hopefully I can still sing. I forgot to bring my water out here. I don't have my water. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. That's another thing I left out, brothers. One of the other big things is, is are you forgetting that when we get to go home, to our real home, we'll get to see Jesus face to face for the first time? Brothers, says Christ, keep your eyes on that blessed hope. Keep your eyes on that blessed hope. Keep staying in the Word daily, brothers, says Christ. Keep praying for one another. Stay in prayer hardcore. Stay in the Word hardcore and live it, brothers, says Christ. I can't say it enough. So... <laughs> Declan says hello, and um, we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ being with you all, and my love for you, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Stay in the Word, brothers Jesus Christ. Keep fighting, keep standing, keep putting on that armor of light, put on Jesus Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. Keep being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And I'll see you in the next study.